Hi guys, hope wherever you are and whatever you've been doing, you've had a super sensational day. I've got a question for you. Did you know that in Australia that there are over 300 languages spoken in the home environment? It's just incredible. Now Australia, being one of the most diverse and multicultural countries in the world, really does present a fantastic opportunity for children to learn and practice another language. But a lot of parents actually believe that a second language could actually be detrimental to their children learning. So tonight we are thrilled to be speaking with Frida Tong, speech pathologist from Youth Thrive Services in Springfield on this very topic. Now Frida is a certified speech pathologist and practicing member and Queensland branch representative member of Speech Pathology Australia. And she has a fond interest in speech, sound disorders, early language and learning uh, difficulties in children. How are you doing Frida? I'm really well tonight. How are you going Rachel? Yeah, I'm super excited to be chatting with you. And um, this is a really interesting concept, I guess, to be able to combine speech pathology therapies and bilingualism. So just wanted to clarify at the get, I guess, is there any connection between the two? Or is this just that you're a speech pathologist who is just passionate about bilingualism? I guess there's a little bit of both. So I am a speech pathologist and I am very passionate about bilingualism. Um, I guess on the base, the first thing that made me passionate about bilingualism is that I'm bilingual myself. Um, and when I became a speech pathologist, I started seeing a lot of children for different language disorders, um, lots of different language delays and started noticing a lot of my children that were coming in um, were also bilingual and that's what really I guess sparked my interest and where that overlap of bilingualism and speech pathology really meshes yeah, yeah. it's um something that is really close to my heart I've been brought up with an Italian family however we never spoke it at home and my brother and myself have, have both sort of lived our life wanting and uh, wanting to be able to speak Italian um at a minimum um, and your article which we're going to speak about in a moment really does sort of highlight all of the, the I guess the benefits um, in children um, being bilingual and all of the benefits that it brings it um, you know on a neural development perspective and then also to their life so um, this is something that I think is really important um, especially as we mentioned at the start having the opportunity to be able to speak so many languages because in Australia we've got you know over 300 spoken so it's unbelievable so on that we we published your article titled um, why Bi bilingualism matters for someone who hasn't read the article could you give us a little bit of an overview of what it's about and what inspired you to write it Absolutely. Um, I guess really it's a bit of a summary on some of the research that um, I've read and some of the journal articles and anecdotal evidence um, and I guess really just different um, information that I have been able to read and really mesh into one spot um, for people who might be bilingual and want to know a little bit more about the benefits of bilingualism or even parents I guess who are kind of stuck in um, the mindset on whether they should really raise their children in a bilingual household or not um, but yes it, so it really just goes through what bilingualism really is and what literature is saying about bilingualism um, and there's a lot of positive stuff out there so um, yeah I just really wanted to put it to one place and thank you guys for publishing it <laughs> course and can you tell us a little bit why like families and parents are thinking that is detrimental to a child um, to be able to, to learn two languages a lot of the time I get a lot of parents who come in and believe that um, by I guess having two or even sometimes three languages in one household that it's going to confuse their children too much mm -hmm. that you know once they're in their school environment they're speaking English but when they come home they're speaking X language and then perhaps mum is speaking one language and then dad speaking another language and they think that often more than not they think that um, it's going to just really confuse them and that it's going to delay their development rather than being super excelled in English they're mediocre in all these other languages but it's not always the case that they're mediocre it's sometimes that um, one language might be a little bit slower than the other but there's an age that at one point it all catches up is what literature is telling us. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah. Just pull out some of the conversational points from the article before we get stuck into your, your three key 
I can't even talk three key questions because there's some really interesting stuff in this article. And you mentioned that studies um, have shown that it does not disadvantage children to be learning more than one language. And in particular, that they sort of soak up all of that knowledge in particular before the age of eight. So was that your scenario that you actually learnt um, a lot of your second language before that age? I actually remember learning my second language. So um, I learned English I started learning, learning English when I was four um, and I would say I was completely proficient at both English and my first language by age of say six or seven. So yeah, I, I feel like that's pretty true. Yeah. And you mentioned also in the article that children are able to tell the difference between two separate languages by the age of five, which is really quite interesting as well. Absolutely. Very, very interesting. And I loved reading um, some of the papers about this that explains that, um, you know, if they're in a household, say, with two different parents, two different languages, they can speak in their secret language with mum and then, uh, I guess, code change into that second language with dad and then still differentiate with brother or sister their own English you know, communication as well. So yeah, by the age of five, that's what literature is telling us and very interesting indeed. Yeah, and it, it, I'm, I'm almost, almost quite envious that the children or anyone that has the ability to be able to do that, I can't even speak English properly, let alone two languages. <laughs> Oh, so, um, you know, what a gift to be able to have. Um, and the last point I just wanted to sort of bring out from the article before we ask the questions, you mentioned from 2011 to 2016 that there was a 4% yeah. decrease of uh, bilingual households and the stats um, around that suggest that the trend will actually continue. So, you know, saying that we are really sport for choices, um, that there are so many languages spoken at home, but that yet there's so few of us actually making the effort to learn that second language. Um, can, I, can you just maybe just give, give us your opinion? Why do you think there's, there's this continual decrease of people learning uh, or making the effort to learn a second language? I think sometimes it might not even be um, learning a second language, but sometimes keeping the first language or keeping um, a native language that might be in a household. So I guess, Australia itself, we're so multicultural and um, the reality is a lot of um, the people that are in Australia, we've come from somewhere. So my parents alone have come from Cambodia and um, I know a lot of people who do have that second language and have now gone on to have families and sometimes what's happening is in as the generations kind of continue, we're losing that first native language from wherever it is that these families have come from. Um, as we're getting immersed into our Australian English culture um, and kind of, I guess, losing our language as we're losing that culture as well. And so I guess what I'd really love to urge is let's keep those languages going. Um, there's 300 of them and we're losing them. So. Yeah, and do you think it's also Very. just the fact that, um, you know, I hate to bring it up, but technology as well, like, you know, a lot of people now um, that go overseas, will, and I've done it myself, having been in Japan, um, and, you know, it was quite difficult to learn that, that language, we actually had a translator um, on, on our phone and those types of things, so technology is actually stopping us from, and preventing us from making the effort to learn a second language, especially when we're travelling. I don't know, what are your thoughts about that? I think it could be. I think, you know, it's it's easier to download an app and trust it and rely on that app to communicate rather than spending, say, three months prior to learn that language of that country that we're about to go in. Um, even if it is, say, 20, 20, 50 words that might be functional in a country, it would still be nice to have, um, you know, a little bit of a different, diverse language um, in your vocab um, but yeah I think the really big thing is that we're losing that um, home language for people who are from different cultures yeah well we've got these uh, three key questions so let's get stuck straight into them so question number one what is bilingualism <laughs> bilingualism is um, really being fluent and understanding um, more than one language yeah all right cool yeah. And question number two, can learning a second language be harmful to a child's learning? Well, really the literature is saying no. Um, I have searched for literature that is saying, looking for, um, I guess, 
the risks and dangers of teaching a child a second, third, fourth language, but I really can't find it. Um, so there's lots of research that says that learning a second or third language is actually quite good um, and beneficial for a child's learning, um, especially for, I guess, their brain development as well. Um, so yeah, there's lots and lots of um, benefits to it. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of cultures have like Sunday school, uh, Greek school on a Sunday, and those types of things where they promote and they, they teach, you know, different languages and that sort of stuff as well. And once again, yeah. I think it's an incredible gift to be able to have the, you know, the ability to be able to think and speak in another language. For lots Absolutely. Of things, which is a perfect segue into question number three. And we get to speak about some really exciting stuff you've got in the article. So what are the benefits of bilingualism? You've got seven of them in your article, in your articles. So I'd love to be able to sort of just sort of chat through some of those. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess we'll just go from straight from top to bottom. Yep. <laughs> so the first one that I have there is that um, we're able to communicate and more effectively um, and efficiently as well. So say if you're in an environment where there are other people that speak the same language or, or that you do or speak um, both or three of the same languages that you do, um, naturally as humans, how we communicate is we try to find the easiest and the laziest way to say something. Uh, which is just truth. <laughs> and if I guess we're speaking in multiple languages, um, you can, rather than speaking in one language and you might say something in 10 words, if you're mixing three languages, you might find an easier way to say something in as little as three words, for example. Um, so that, yeah, I guess speaking more efficiently, um, having more vocabulary in your head as well, um, from knowing different I guess, multiple languages. Um, another thing is, I guess, really feeling a sense of um, belongingness to a culture even, I guess, sometimes when you might be able to speak with your, your grandma. Say if, um, Rach, you, you, if you were able to speak with, um, you know, elderly family Italian, some, in, in some sense, would that make you feel, I guess, more connected in some capacity? I know for me it would. Yeah. Um, the, the challenging part in that, in a lot of languages, you've got dialects as well. So you'll speak, you know, the native overall, you know, Italian, but then of course we, there's countless different dialects in different villages and parts of Italy as well, or any other language. So, but, um, you know, in that in its sense is almost like a different language again, because you've got the native and then you've got the dialect. Um, but a hundred percent, you know, it would increase um, your ability to, to have that sense of belonging a hundred percent. Yeah, and even with different dialects, I know um, my first language was Cambodian, but I'm not amazing at it because I have been immersed and speak English so much. But um, I went to Cambodia once and being able to speak the language did make me feel a little bit more, um, I guess, part of the culture. Yeah. Um, and as though I did belong to the place. So, yeah. Um, another thing that I guess... The largest thing um, that I've taken away from a lot of the research that I've read into and something that has um, been, I guess, the greatest thing that I've been able to read <laughs> and have loved learning about um, bilingualism is that there's actually a lot um, of protective mechanisms neurologically. So something that I read was that it actually helps to um, delay later age onset dementia wow. um, and that. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, and it's it's through a term that they call in literature cognitive reserve. So because there are more things that are, I guess there's more activation happening in the brain, um, it's it's said, said that it's supposed to encourage um, increase of memory, increase of executive control, um, increase of decoding and coding, uh, encoding and task switching. So that's a really um, big one that, I think is a massive benefit to yeah. um, bilingualism. Mm. That's Protecting our brain. 100%. And that's just, um, if any reason, I'm, I think I'm going to start learning it now. So I don't know, but that, that's, a, that's a really valid point. And as you said, there's um, that's, that's a nice little chunky answer that you've got in the article, so that's worthwhile sort of anyone clicking on the link at the bottom of um, this introduction paragraph to have a read of the article and read up a little bit more on that one. But what's the next one? Um, okay, so 
with bilingualism because I guess with that going a little bit back to the activation of the brain as well it helps with fluidity of learning a third or fourth or fifth language um, and it helps to pick up sounds as well so if you're exposed to more than just English you're hearing lots of other different sounds and you're practicing lots of different sounds it's easier then to make um, similar sounds or more sounds as a third or fourth language because you'd have more shared sounds yeah. Um, and that's just with exposure to different tongue movements and lip movements and um, different sounds that you're hearing through, a, you know, a second language. Yeah. Um, the brain's more supple and that sort of stuff as well. Or how does that work at a cognitive level? It's just the fact that we're using the brain more and it's just more active and it's sort of more fit per se, would you say? That's it. Yeah. Literature says that it's because of the brain activation and there's more, um, I guess, more firing on in the brain there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, right, what's the next one? It's awesome. Next one. Um, okay. So this one, I it, it's something that I believe. Um, so and literature also does say this. There are stats around this. Um, with people who do have a second or third language, it's easier for them to get jobs. Yes. Um, so in terms of career prospects, um, especially being in Australia and where I guess. Um, there are so many people who come here um, on holidays alone. Um, having that second or third language makes us really competitive. Yes. To be able to speak to people who are coming here on holidays, especially in those seasons where um, I'm lost for words right now. I'm lost for the word that I'm looking for when people come here for holidays. Yeah. Um, well, on this point, it's really interesting. I was talking to a business a couple of days ago about, you know, the baby expos that we have all around Australia. And, and there yeah. Were fact that um, given that we have a high Asian population in Australia that they are looking at putting uh, Mandarin speaking people um, working for their businesses on the stands at the expos which is going to yeah. offer opportunities um, obviously for increased amount of custom and, 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 and families to be able to buy their products and services so and this is just one example out of countless industries and that sort of stuff as well but 100% um, you know opening up the opportunity for career opportunities here and abroad um, it's, it's one of those things and, and like anything the world's getting more competitive <laughs> in all aspects so I think any, any, any opportunities for children that are going to help them in their career uh, in the modern workforce is something that we should definitely consider um, sort of you know in energy in the education in the, sort of in the adolescence for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I, there's, I guess there's a lot of trade happening amongst the countries as well and having, um, you know, a second, third language that might be shared with a country, say, if you're running a business or if you're um, working in a business that does do a bit of trading or does communicate across the seas, then that um, really lends itself as a skill as well. Yes, 100%. Mm. All right, next point, next point. Next point, okay. Um, and... Almost, okay, second last point here um, is that it gives an academic advantage. So for children who are learning um, a second or third language, as we're talking about, you know, that neural development and lots of activation going on in the brain there, um, lots of research is saying that that is very true, um, but also that it helps build um, the middle of the brain. So the, the part of the brain that really um, helps children cope with different things like attention and task maintenance, um, even regulating their emotions. Um, yeah, there's, there's research out there that's saying that um, having a second or third language really helps with that. Um, so I think that's um, definitely a benefit for, I'm sorry? Do you know why that is? Look, I actually don't really know to be completely honest with you why that happens and I think that just um, lends itself for space for more research to be done um, about bilingualism and more and how the brain really develops for children who are bilingual so let's really encourage people to be bilingual so we can do more research in those areas because as these languages disappear there's not going to be much research around it anymore yeah oh, 100 percent and final point Last point there um, is ease of travel. So I guess that kind of goes and ties hand in hand with our point about career prospects. Um, not only learning that different second language can help with, I guess, those career prospects and traveling for trade and that sort of thing, but really just traveling leisurely as well. So um, having, I guess, a language that is shared across 
different countries. So something like Mandarin or something like Spanish, those ones that are really um, quite highly used across different countries, they're really beneficial because you can go and travel anywhere really and um, have a, a second or third language that might be shared with that country. Yeah, so um, those I guess are really just seven surface points, but I would imagine there are so many, so so many more points um, that I'd be able to squeeze into this. But I guess in terms of um, having that research article, these were just the seven main ones that I really wanted to share. Yeah. Mm. So you've been really insightful tonight, and just given us lots to think about. So as you're 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 in your role as a speech pathologist, as you mentioned at the start of the chat, that you've actually had you know a lot of families come into this uh, service um, as well. What what messages would you have? Um, final messages would you have for, for parents out there who are maybe considering um, you know investing the time, and energy, resources into having their ch their child learn a second language? Um, and you know, you know, what advice do you have as to why they should, from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess the main thing from my perspective, and I've said it a couple of times tonight, is really let's keep those second, third languages going. And I think um, if if you are in a household and you yourself are a parent and you speak a different language, don't worry about that. Don't worry about stopping yourself from speaking that second language. Really encourage, um, I guess, that second language with your child. And um, I think really foster that sort of second culture in your home as well. And um, don't be afraid to use that second language because literature is out there and it says that there is no problem with having that second language there and it's not going to be detrimental to their learning. And I guess if um, anyone is wanting a second opinion um, or wanting to look more into to the literature, there's lots of literature out there, but there's also lots of speech pathologists out there that, um, you know, who work in language and you can tap on their doors and um, ask them for a second opinion as well. Yeah. So if mum, yeah. mums and dads and parents have got any questions for you and or want to reach out to you um, for, for any other expert in opinion and advice, whereabouts can they find you? Yeah, so um, I am easily accessible through um, our website. So um, it's just www.youthrive.com.au. Um, and so I'm working as, as a speech pathologist as, at Springfield, as you said. Um, and that it's an easy phone call as well if anybody is wanting to ring. Um, we have speech pathologists here, but we also got OTs and psychs as well. So um, they also lend lots of um, information to, I guess, children who are working, uh, who are bilingual as well, and they they, they work amongst um, children who have developmental disorders and language delays also. Cool. So before we go, can you just give us and teach us one word in Cambodian before we go to <laughs> actually learn at least something? Okay. Um, something is easy. Something functional. Um, hello? Yes. Okay. Is source nay. Source nay. Source nay. Oh, source with an N. Source nay? No, no. Source nay. So if I were to spell it, S, it would be like S O U. R, cannot accept sua, and then S D A Y. What? Oh, source day. Yes. Source day. Okay. Oh, you say it so well, Rach. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, at least I've learned one word tonight. Source day. Thank you. That's very it. Much. <laughs> I've really thank loved you for having me, Rach. Tonight, and hopefully we'll, like we'll be able to chat about something else like really, really soon. Take care. Thanks, Rach. See you. Right, bye. <laughs> bye.